please to Genesis chapter 2. The book of Genesis chapter 2 and stand at the reading of God's word. As Moses is anointed by the Holy Spirit, carried along by God, to given this revelation of what had happened at the, uh, the origins of, of man. Um, in the first chapter, he gives the outline, kind of shows us what's, goes, what's happening. Much like God does, you'll, you'll see him do this in scripture, especially prophetic scripture. Kind of give a, a broad brush stroke of what happens and then when God wants to detail something he'll go back the next chapter and kind of really focus it in on on an area and that's exactly what the Lord is doing here in this second chapter uh, of, of the book of Genesis and we're gonna pick it up here at verse 15 and go to the end of the end of the passage the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it now by the way just think of what that what is like no weeds, no death, not, the enemy hadn't fallen yet. Can you imagine a garden that perpetually continued to just grow beautifully? The creativity there. Could you imagine what would have happened if, if, if man didn't fall? That garden would have kept going and going and going. Amazing. Well, anyway, back to verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of, out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. By the way, man was made out of dirt. Women were made out of flesh. Isn't that interesting? Go ahead, nudge your husband that I said that. <laughs> I give you permission. Verse 23, the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha, for she was taken out of Ish. For this reason, a man will live with his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Father, thank you so much for your holy word. Thank you so much that you have given us, Lord, revelation of our origins. Lord, we believe your word is absolute. We believe your word is true. We believe your word is infallible. That this, Lord, is, is not poetry, this is history, and we embrace it as such, for our Lord Jesus embraces it as such. Speak to us now, Lord. Restore to this church, restore to our brothers and sisters, restore to my own heart the sense of honor in marriage that you want us to have. I pray this in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now, if you're a man, turn around and say, I'm Ish. If you're a woman, say, hi, I'm Isha. Go ahead. Would you? Got a lot of Ishas and a lot of Ishas in this place. <laughs> now, 
Now this morning, um, I want to... I want to speak about God's role in marriage. You know, a, as you know, there, there, there's a current debate across our land concerning the redefinition of what marriage is. And, and this debate is becoming a hot button. So hot that it is even gone and going to the Supreme Court. Our Supreme Court justices are already speaking about this issue. Now, though this is of grave concern that, that threatens one of America's last biblical moorings, my, my aim this morning is not to talk to you about culture. Instead, what I want to do is I want to speak to our hearts. And, and here's the reason why. God's Word tells us in Hebrews 13.4, read it with me, would you? Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Notice the two alls there. Now I hold that if this first line... Marriage should be honored by all is taking place the way God intends. The other issues of parity that this passage is dealing with would automatically be taken care of. But I wonder if it's being honored by us the way that God intended it to be. See, if we truly honor marriage the way God intends for us to honor marriage, we who are married would keep our marriage bed pure. We who are not married would honor the other married. We honor the institution so much. Honor God in the institution so much. There would not be a hint. There would not be, we would not dare do the adultery thing if we were married or if we were not married violate God in any way who sanction intimacy as his wedding gift only for the married couple. Amen. The synonyms for honor is respect, esteem, and reverence. Thus, marriage should be respected by all. Amen. Marriage should be esteemed by all. And marriage should be reverenced by all. Amen. And it's this last phrase, marriage should be reverenced, that I want us to focus on. The reason why we, we would reverence marriage is because we see God involved in marriage. There is not a marriage on this planet. There is not a legitimate marriage, whether it's Christians or non-Christians, that God Almighty, the God of the Bible, is not involved in. Did you know that? And this is the truth. See, my, my concern is that the institution of marriage has become skewed, become warped by we believers because we've taken more of a cultural view of what marriage is than a biblical one. We've allowed magazine and TV and we've allowed songs on the radio to define what marriage is. And we stopped with what God said. We stopped looking at that and stopped embracing that. And worse, because the damage that difficult and broken marriages has caused the now majority of Christians who have gone in to the church. Did you know there's more Christians in the church today who has been in broken marriages? Not 
counting those who are going through the difficult marriages and not counting the vast majority of the children who have been so hurt by broken marriages that their hearts cause them to feel something than honor, respect, esteem, and reverence for it. Let me tell you so much so that even Christian young people sometimes, though they know it is a sin, they're not dumb. They read this verse. A sin before God that he will judge them for. Out of their fear of experiencing the pain and the hurt and the turmoil of the previous marriage or the, or the marriage that they had witnessed, they would rather live together than to bring honor to God. And there is something wrong that not only that thinking needs to be corrected, but there's something about their hearts that King Jesus needs to enter into and heal. Amen. And he wants to. He wants to. So it's for the sake of our relationship with God and the sake of our relationship with truth itself that I want us to take, uh, to, to go to the biblical origins of of marriage and to see what God is up to in it. Why should you and I honor marriage in such a way that we even have a reverence for it? The way we should have when we walk into the house of God. The way we should have when we open up the word of God. Why? Why? And how shall we then respond if God is involved that much? So are you up for the journey? Well, you're here, so regardless. <laughs> All right. God places man, as we see in our text, in, in the garden. And the interesting thing is that, is that, after he tells them, listen, you can have all these options of what you can have. By the way, did you know for everyone, how many good trees do you think was in that garden? All of them. Did you get, guess, guess, I mean, get, would you say a million plants? Would that be a guess? We, don't, we just don't know, right? Did you know that, 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 it's, that it's still true today? There is, there's a million good choices over the one sinful choice. There's a million choices that God gives us over the one sinful choice. It's still true to this day. It really is. It really is. God takes man. He puts him in the garden. He puts him in the garden to work it, to be creative, to, 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 to do the things that he does. He commands man, eat of any tree. Just don't eat of this one. And then the first thing he says is, he says in verse 18, read it, read it with me, would you please? The Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is this. The reason why we honor and we reverence marriage is because God is the one who invented marriage. God is the one who created marriage. Marriage is not something that Adam and Eve just sat around and said, well, we're bored. What should we? Let's get married. What's married? I don't know. Let's make it up as we go. It was never that way. This comes from the very heart of God. Now, by the way, did you read anything in our text that said Adam was lonely. No. Not one thing that said Adam was lonely. What he says here, it is not good that Adam should be alone. And as a matter of fact, if you look that up in the Hebrew, is it, is it saying it's not good that Adam should be the only of his kind. Everything else had something else of its kind. Even God Almighty, one God who eternally, concurrently exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 
And God said it's not good that Adam would be the only of his kind. And so does, does God then just say, let's put him to sleep, let's hurry up, and let's build him a wife? Look what he does. Before he does that, God creates all these animals right out of the ground and has Adam name them. After Adam names them, isn't it interesting that it says, and he found no suitable helper. You know why? God Almighty knew it wasn't good that Adam should be the only of his kind. Adam didn't even realize there was something up until after he started naming all the animals and saw the animals were in pairs and saw there's this and there's that and there's an, that looks like an aardvark. I don't know why he said aardvark, but aardvark. You know, and, and, he, and he said all those. And then, and then there, there was a discovery in Adam himself. There was no suitable helper. Which brings us, by the way, to this term helper. You see that? Ezer in the Bible. Did you know that word is used throughout the Bible to describe God? For instance, in Psalm 118.7. This suggests, unlike what Archie Bunker said, this suggests that in no way was woman ever inferior to man but bore that special image of God as a perfect answer for a companion. Oh, wife, that's good enough for you to bump your husband again. I'm, I'm telling you. She bore something of God's image in order to help man. But here, let me ask you, when I, let me just ask you something. Adam is in the garden. Is the garden perfect? Is everything perfect? Was Adam just, what did God look in the garden and said, Adam, you're dropping your fig leaves. You're never picking them up and putting them in the watch machine. You know, and Adam, you just don't, you know, all you're doing is eating bananas. You need to have a better diet than that. You know, was God ever saying anything like that? By the way, there was no fig leaves yet. On him, anyway. <laughs> So what in the world did Adam need help with? Why would Adam need help? To cook? No. To clean? No. Now listen, I'm going to make a statement here. And the thing that I do, I know some of you. And the thing that I don't want you to do is to go home and say, Hallelujah, Pastor Tim says, Honey, I don't have to cook or clean no more. Yeah, lunch is on you, baby. Okay? Don't you dare do that because it says in the New Testament, we're to serve one another in love. Amen? So you can't use that on me. Don't you dare. But listen, what was the whole purpose of Adam and Eve being in the garden? The whole purpose of Adam, of Adam being in the garden is to, first of all, know God. Second of all, enjoy God. Thirdly, glory in God. Fourthly, to bear God's image. That was his job. To know God, to enjoy God, to glory in God, and to bear God's image. And do you suppose that unlike the culture that tells us the purpose of marriage is to be happy. Do you suppose that God created marriage so that husband and wife can serve one another in love to help them better know God and enjoy God and glory in God and bear God's image? But we were sold a bill of goods when we started buying into, I get married because he's to make me happy. I get married, she is to make me happy. Are you kidding me? And then, and then these little brides, you know, and six months into their relationship with their husband, what, what do we ask? We ask, we, we ask, are you happy? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The very word itself comes from happenstance. It depends on what's just going on. 
And there's nothing in the Bible that says they're there to make you happy. Well, hallelujah, I'm fulfilling my role then. That's not what I'm saying either. But what I am saying is that the first and foremost, it's to help each other know God, Amen. love God, glory in God, and bear God's image. Oh, pastor, you don't know my husband. My husband, he's doing the opposite. Really? And so I say, so how much patience do you have? To, oh, I have to have patience for him all the time. <laughs> is God patient? See, even in difficult marriages, God has a plan. C come on. How many of you in your marriage had to learn to perfect forgiveness? Is God forgiving? It's not interesting, so it's working. How many of you in your marriage, the last person sometimes it's hardest to be kind to is that person that you're looking at across the breakfast table? And so you have to press. <laughs> Mike, Ashley puts her hand up, and Mike just puts it down. <laughs> Practice kindness. There goes the patience thing again. Right? Right? And so, and so is it interesting that those things, those qualities, are even being developed even in difficult marriages? Why? That's what God primarily created marriage for. And that's what he's involved in marriage. Now, is it to also help one another and have a life together and things like that? You bet. You bet. And we'll talk a little more about that. But primarily, marriage is not for happiness. <laughs> and every one of you who've been married for any length of time. See, because this is what happens. Those of you who bought into this theme, marriage is about happiness. As soon as they make you unhappy more times than they make you happy in a year, you're, you're thinking you got sold a bill of goods and you're ready to bolt. This is not what God's plan is. We honor marriage and reverence marriage because God created it for his specific purposes. Amen. Amen. So, he puts Adam to sleep. He opens up his side. And then he says, and by the way, in your notes, I, I, there's a typo. I left out the word to become Glenn Fletch. It's right up here. Read it with me, would you please? Here's the second reason why we honor reverence marriage. Here's the revelation. The Holy Spirit speaking through Moses gives this and shows this is the very reason for marriage. Okay, re ready? Read it with me. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. We honor and reverence marriage because God is the one who defines marriage. Amen. Now, I want you to listen very closely, especially in the culture we're living in right now. If God created it, and if God is the one who's working in it, God has the right to define it. Amen? Amen? Let them create whatever they want to create, but don't call it marriage, because God already has the license on that. Amen. God is the one who created marriage. And as a matter of fact, I'll tell you this. This is what I've learned. No person or human institution can redefine something that God has established without perverting it and without mutating it into something else. And that's the truth. Once we start modifying or redefining, you're going to pervert it, you're going to mutate it, and it's no longer going to be marriage. And they've done the same thing with the church. They, they pervert, they, they're mutated, they're changing it. They're saying church is this, church is that. God said what church was. God's the one who created it. Yeah. And once they start redefining it and rebuilding, it's no longer church. And once we start redefining what Christianity is, it's no longer Christianity. And once we start defining what salvation is, it's no longer salvation. 
Would you, would you, would you understand that? So, so then listen, listen. God already defined marriage. And this is what marriage is. Anything other than one man and one woman who leaves and cleaves and becomes one flesh together for life as God has joined them together in covenant is not marriage. That's marriage. And it will be void of the spiritual and soul structure of oneness that only God can give. Don't believe the lies out there. Oh, baby, baby, when you and I are together and we just, ooh, you know. <laughs> You warm my form, and we merge, and, and oh baby, we're one together. Only God can make them one. Right. It's a spiritual thing. And it's not just one spiritually, it is a soul thing. Amen. Amen. Oh, we honor and reverence marriage because God is the one who defines it. But not only that, we honor and define marriage because it's blessed by God. When I was a kid and I was a part of my grandmother's church, I would hate for her to read this verse because it grossed me out to have my own grandmother read this verse in public. I wish my kids were here this morning so I could gross them out <laughs> this morning. Read it with me. And the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Woohoo! That's beautiful. See, we honor and reverence marriage because it's the only structure that God gives for a man and a woman to enjoy intimacy in a spiritually and an emotionally healthy way. Intimacy is given by God solely as a wedding gift to married couples for their enjoyment, for procreation of godly offspring, and as a bonding agent. It is. It is. And people who bond in intimacy outside of marriage covenant are bonding to something, first of all, by nature is not permanent. Brothers and sisters, we said for life. And we mean it. And one of the reasons why marriage is not, is, is not sensing the blessing and the presence of God is because there are some people who went to the altar and oh, they, they got all fancied up and they got all doodled up and they got there and they listened to the pastor and they, and they were talking heads and they, and they repeated the words. But in their heart of hearts, they were thinking, bucko, if this doesn't work, I'm out of here. And, and I'm telling you, God sees the heart. God sees the heart. He does. No. People who bond in intimacy outside of marriage covenant are not only bonding to something by nature is not permanent, but it's not blessed. And if it's not blessed, it means they're bonding to something that's cursed. Would you hear that? If you are having sex outside of marriage, you are bonding to something that's cursed. Do you hear me? Amen. And this is part of God's judgment. Not just, not just going to hell, but the very fact that, that, that the, the great emotional and spiritual damage that happens to people because they've entered into something that was reserved only for the marriage bed. And I refer you back to our first verse that said, God will judge all the sexually immoral, every kind. So we're not going to pick on one certain kind of class of sexual immorality. All of them are sexual immorality. And see, it goes against God. Let me tell you something about sin. God didn't go, God, God didn't, God didn't say this is sin because, well, let's figure out the funnest things for them to do and call it sin. <laughs> I'm going to do that. The reason why sin is sin is because first and foremost, it goes against the very character of who God is. You and I were created to bear the very image of God. 
And when, when a sin is a sin, it's because we are no longer bearing the image of God. Part of the image of God is this. God is one and is committed and is in covenant. And he would never change that. And he would never attach himself to anything that would not be according to his righteous ways. And so when we do, we're no longer bearing the image of God. And we're violating and offending God. Amen. The second reason why it's a sin is because it always hurts people. Whatever a sin is, it will always hurt. It's going to hurt somebody. Amen? Amen. Well, hallelujah that the blood of Jesus not only forgives, but brothers and sisters, listen to me. The Bible says he who sins sexually, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, sins against his own flesh. So you ask Jesus to forgive you. You know what he did? He totally forgave you. Your sin has been removed from you as far as the east is from the west. Amen? Amen. But now there's an issue of brokenness in our bodies that needs to be healed. Would you let King Jesus in and provide the healing because he wants to do that too? Make you as if you've never, ever, ever sinned sexually, ever. And my Savior can do it. Amen. 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 But we honor marriage. Because it's the only structure that gives for a man and woman to enjoy intimacy in a very healthy and spiritually wonderful way. But leaving the pages of, of our origins of the book of Genesis, there's a couple other reasons. And Genesis is mentioned. People came up to, came up to Jesus and, and people were asking about divorce whether it's right or wrong, and what's going on with the divorce. And, and Jesus said something, and he gave a, an amazing revelation. Look, look, look what he said. Read it with me, would you? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Out of Genesis, right? And then Jesus gives this revelation to that. Keep reading. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. We honor and reverence marriage because God acts in each marriage to create the spiritual and the emotional oneness in a couple's soul. God didn't just act in the first marriage and said, take it away. God acts in every marriage. And the moment a couple said, whether they are saved or not saved, I do. Did you know God was there too saying, I do as well. You see, brothers and sisters, part of the problem is that I know marriages can be difficult. And so we go to them and we want them to change and we keep looking, but we get so focused on one third of the marriage party. And we might be so disappointed in him or so disappointed in her, but you're forgetting the other third will never disappoint you. And he's involved in your marriage covenant too. He's the one who's making the two one so that you can bring glory to him. You can know him. All of us, whether you ever get married or not, should be honoring and reverencing marriage for what God will do in you and through you and in them and through them. God is the one. Only he, only he, can make a marriage a spiritual and soul union. Nothing else can. Only he can. And we got to bless that and understand that and go to him. Oh, but there are such deficits in my marriage. Okay, I understand. Ask God, what are you up to in this in my life? And go to him who has no deficits. And let them touch you. And let them bless you. And let them help you. 
But pastor, I've already blown it. I've been divorced and, and I'm remarried. Does that mean? Oh, no, no, no. You just let God bless you and bless your marriage you're in. But pastor, what if there's, there's adultery on his part? Or what if he's an unbeliever? And well, the Bible gives these reasons. And, and there's legitimate reasons, but that's not what the message is today. The message is, is why we're honoring God and reverencing God in marriage. Finally, the Holy Spirit moves upon Paul. And he's talking to the church and he's telling that we need to serve one another and submit to one another. And then the Holy Spirit says, and wives, submit to your husbands as Christ to the church. And husbands, you love your, your, your bride as Christ loves the church. I'm sorry. Brides, submit to your husbands as the church to Christ. Read it with me. And so he writes, isn't it interesting? He goes back to the principle again. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And now another revelation is given. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. We honor and reverence marriage because it was created by God to bring him glory, bearing the image of Christ and his church. That's what your marriage is for also. Not only to help you grow in the Lord, but your marriage is to show your children something that Christ and the church looks like. It's to show your neighbors something that Christ and the church looks like. It's to show your community something that Christ and the church looks like. Now, there is no condemnation in this place. The power of the blood of Jesus can not only forgive all the offenses we had against God, and Jesus took it on himself. Would you say amen? amen? And the power of the healing touch of Jesus can walk into your marriage right now and heal the areas where you have shown God disrespect. That's right. And God can heal you. And he wants to. Jesus loves you. But brothers and sisters, I believe it's high time that you and I start learning to walk in reverence. And walking in reverence isn't just a once a Sunday type, once a week type thing. Walking in reverence is giving reverence to everything that God is involved in and seeing how he's involved in it and worshiping him and honoring him and glorying him in it. Amen. Amen. And, and listen, listen, some of you, you, you are widows in this place. Some of you, you're widowers in this place. And, and you may never, ever get married again. But you have people you talk to. You need to show them the origins of marriage and why we're to reverence God in it. All of us knows kids and grandkids, and we need to talk to them. If we don't, who will? They're listening. They're listening to the radio, and they're listening to culture, and they're listening to everything else. It's our job. It's our job. It's our job. It's our job to, to show them why Jesus is so worth loving and serving, even in difficult marriages. It's our job to show them that, you know, I know it's tough, and I know you see us disagree, but you know what, honey? I, I, I love them, and I'm committed to them, and you know what's going on in my life? What's going on in my life is I'm learning how to submit to Jesus more than ever before. I'm learning how to trust Jesus more than ever before. I'm learning that only Jesus is the one who can help me. By the way, isn't it interesting that God knew what Adam truly needed, and only God was the one who could take care of it? Adam discovered he had a need, but he could never take care of it. And by the way, don't you think marriage serves that purpose really well? Marriage has a way of showing us we have needs. And my wife and I have to go before the Lord in prayer. And we do. All the time. At least twice a day. Seriously. And we pray. We pray for each other. And seek the Lord. And honey, God, God is in our marriage. Think about that. I told first service, and I'll tell you, I wonder if God's bored with us. Because entertainment to my wife and I is to sit down and watch some dumb show, some dumb who done it, and try to figure out who done it. Come on, kids, come on, kids. 
we love, we love the Lord and we love each other. Amen. But our hearts really to just reverence God. God is to be worshipped. Some of us have learned to dishonor spouses. And, and, and quite frankly, they've really helped. But for God's sake, there's always something to honor. There's always something to uphold. And remember, they're only one-third of a three-part proposition. Amen? This is heavy on my heart. I hope you're hearing something. We honor marriage. We reverence it because marriage comes from God. Marriage is defined by God. Marriage is blessed by God. Marriage happens by God. Marriage glorifies God. Amen. Let's bow our hearts before him, shall we? Lord, we, we receive today in communion just your powerful touch. But Lord, we're, we're asking this morning as we conclude this time together. First of all, if we've had bad attitudes about marriage and about the institution, would you, would you please heal us? Would you please heal our hearts? If some of us, Lord, are so full of fear that we don't want to do and feel in that that we're actually going to get would you convict us and would you would you help us get this straight in our life forgive us for the idolatry of what we made marriages out of what we thought it was supposed to be and lord would you would you help us to bend our knee of what marriage is intended to be by you would you forgive us lord for not reverencing marriage not reverencing you in it and not honoring it the way it's to be honored. Forgive us for thinking marriage is a contract and not realizing it is a lifelong covenant. Forgive us. Heal us. Heal us in this church. Help us to be people of great reverence to you in every area that you're involved in. In Jesus' name, amen. Stan, would you please?